Hey there, everybody. Welcome back. So, moving on from rotational kinematics, uh, that kind of begs the question, well, wouldn't things that rotate also have a kinetic energy, right? They're also moving, just like objects from chapters 7 and 8 were moving in a straight line, but objects now may be rotating, okay? They're uh, infinitesimally moving in a straight line, if that makes sense, right? Because they always have some tangential speed. If some, say, wheel is, is turning, right, at every point in time, it'll have a tangential speed. If that's constant or not, it, it, it doesn't really matter. In this case, if it's rotating with some omega, it'll always have v. So that leads us to to consider the kinetic energy of rotation, okay? It doesn't have a kinetic energy of linear motion, right? It's not one-half mv squared necessarily. So let's take a look at what it would be, in this case, for rotation. All right, so, um, and this applies to any object of any shape, right? If it's rotating, that means it's rotating uh, about a single axis, right? Assuming it's a solid um, object. So it's kinetic energy, which is still K, um, is one half mv squared, right? But actually, let me do, I'm gonna write it as a sum, and I'll, I'll make sense of this in a second. If I write it like this, right, this is still the same form from chapter 7, 1 half mv squared. However, I've written it as a summation notation because let's say you do have that solid disk, right, like a, a merry-go-round base or, or some kind of carousel, right, some, some ride at a park. If this is moving uh, around with some angular speed omega, this is a solid object of some total mass M, capital M, well, that means we have tiny chunks of it all around this object, right? And each of these chunks say they're of mass tiny m, right? There's, say, m1, up here is m2, you get the picture, right? m3. This is made up of a lot of tiny little masses, Right? If you will, it's an infinite amount of infinitely small masses. We'll get to that in a second. That's calculus. But for right now, we need to add up all of those masses. And if this is a rigid and solid object, each of those masses are rotating themselves with the same omega. Right? Because this is a, a rigid object. We don't have a differential rotation, if you will. Um, so that means that each of the little masses here has the same omega, but a different tangential speed, v. So let me write it here. So that has omega, omega, and by the way, the central axis is right there. Okay, All have a diff or the same omega, but different linear speeds v. And the relationship here, remember, um, linear speed is, well, let's see, distance equals rate times time. So a rate is a distance over time. And in this case, the distance is the arc length s, right? The arc length s. So if we say some mass moves some arc length right there, it sweeps out some angle, right? And it's some distance we'll call, uh, what do I want to say? Some distance r from the central axis. So this arc length is s, and that's written as r times theta, okay? So each of these masses here, m1, 2, 3, 4, 
have some distance from the center, and they're moving around that central axis with some omega, right? But they're sweeping out different uh, arc lengths, s. It turns out that it doesn't matter. All of them is equal to s over t, or r over t, and we can write them all as r times omega, okay? Because omega is defined as an angle over time. Okay, so let's take this expression and plug it into our equation over here. So the sum over all of these masses and all of their linear speeds v, we can now write as the following. So we have all of those masses have a, a different distance from the center, right? Distance being r in this case, a different radius. So that's say r2, that's r1, that's r3, right? Etc. etc. So r times omega. I'm not putting a subscript on omega because each of those masses has the same omega. And that is quantity squared. And so what we have is, I'll tell you what, should I pull the sum out or the, the one half? Yeah, let's do that. One half times the sum of all m's and all r squareds. And the omega squared is a constant, so that kind of, I'll, I'll tag that at the end, okay? And so this sum is for all masses at each of those respective radii, right? Or distances from the center. And so only those change. But if we add them all up, we get kind of that term by itself. And one half and omega squared will be the constants. <coughs> Excuse me. And physicists call this term here the moment of inertia. And we write that as I. Okay? And that's known as the, quote, moment of inertia. Big fancy term here. Okay? So a moment, uh, that's kind of an... an antiquated term for this. Don't think of it as a moment in time. It's it's just a, I don't know, it's a term that came about long ago and has stuck and 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 been ingrained in, in physics textbooks ever since. So just r roll with it, no pun intended. Um, moment of inertia. The inertia, ah, you may recognize inertia from one of the early chapters, right? Specifically, Newton's uh, first law. Any object in motion tends to stay in motion. Well, in this case, any object in rotation tends to stay in rotation. So, this moment of inertia basically translates to an object's resistance to changes in its rotation. Okay? And so, what affects this? Well, the mass and the distance from the rotational axis. The more mass an object has, the, the bigger its moment of inertia value. Thus, the harder it is to change its rotational speed. The harder it is to slow it down or speed it up rotationally. Okay? So if this was a giant merry-go-round that was on some, say, frictionless axis, right? And you were just one person trying to push this giant merry-go-round around, it'd be really hard, right? Because a merry-go-round, if you've ever ridden on one, is, is, is fairly big. But if you were at a local park and they had a tiny carousel, you know, the ones with the, 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 the rails there and you would get on and your friends would spin you and then your little brother would fly off and then cry, right? That would be a lot smaller. And so if it was just you, that'd be a lot easier to rotate because it's less massive. Similarly, R here, right? It's harder to rotate an object that's much larger, right? Or has a much greater radius, 
right? Like the merry-go-round, has a greater radius than a smaller carousel, okay? Um, and so that's the moment of inertia. It's effectively an object's resistance to change in rotation, okay? So ultimately, we can write this k rot, right? Kinetic energy of rotation, k rot. It's like a West Coast radio station that you'd see in, in Grand Theft Auto or whatever. So we have this as one half I omega squared. This is now the kinetic energy of rotation. And this value, you might think, well, hey, aren't all objects, you know, most objects are not nice, solid, rigid disks, right? And you would be right. So this value of I, this moment of inertia, this here actually applies for many types of objects, all right? And in fact, we have various uh, expressions for I depending upon what type of object is, is doing the rotating. If it's just a single particle of mass M, some distance from the axis of, of rotation, so like um, planets around the the sun, all right? That I expression is simply m r squared, right? It doesn't have to be connected. That's the thing here. It doesn't have to be rigidly connected to still have a moment of inertia value. Uh, in the case of a rigid rod, like we see here in these two cases, this depends on where the axis of rotation is located. If it's located in the exact the middle of this rod, like it is here, um, notice that's also the location of the center of mass. So if that's the case, that will be the easiest to rotate that rod. And you can see that because 1 12th ml squared, L being the distance from the axis, 1 12th is much less than this value over here of 1 3rd. Right? So when the axis is at the center of the rod, it's easier to rotate than over here when the axis is on one end. There is more material from this rod further from the axis. So thus it's harder to rotate it. Right? You can do this too at home. If you find, say, a broomstick handle, a baseball bat, um, any, you know, pole, any long, rigid object, try it out. Assuming it's, it's fairly uniform in mass. I know a baseball bat isn't really, but it's, it's close enough. If you hold it from the center, right, and just turn your wrist or, or turn your arm, it's fairly e e easy to do that, right? Um, in fact, that's a really good exercise. If you hold barbells, just, just rotate them in your arms, okay? You'll make your, your forearms burn very quick. But if you hold that same object from one end and then try and rotate it, it's a lot harder, okay? Because even though it's the same mass, it's the L value that's changing, right? There's more mass further from the axis in this case than over here, right? So thus, the moment of inertia in this case, about one end, is larger than it is when the axis is through the center, okay? And so we have other expressions for other, you know, spheres, solid sphere, um, hollow sphere, cylinder, what have you, okay? Um, and you are free to use this, right, during homeworks or an exam, right? In fact, I encourage you to write these expressions down, okay? Because I don't expect you really to memorize them. It's good if you can, but I don't expect you to, right? Um, yeah, right? That's basically it. That's, that's the moment of inertia and k-rot, right? So remember, moment of inertia, I, is essentially an object's resistance to changes in its rotation. All right, thanks for watching.